Hi everyone, in this video we are going to discuss the schematic of a nuclear power plant. So hopefully by the very end of this video you at home will be able to actually draw out this schematic and be able to fully explain how we are able to take fuel, which it starts off as enriched pellets, and we're able to actually harness all of this energy that's escaped. So let's start at the very, very beginning, which is our source of fuel. So fuel source is basically um, a bunch of different little pellets that we store in things called fuel rods. So fuel rods full of enriched uranium-235 pellets. So let's review some terms here. Enriched uranium-235, by definition, that just means that it has a greater than 0.7% of U-235. Remember, usually this fuel source is uranium-238. So now, for a power plant, our ideal fuel source is actually anywhere between 3 to 5% of our enriched uranium, okay? Now, what is a uranium pellet? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's this teeny tiny little thing that looks like a pellet. It's about the size of a U.S. dime. And what we do is we take these little pellets and we stack them on top of each other. So we have 200 different pellets that we put like this in a vertical column. Okay, then we put them all together and we get this thing, oh man, I cannot draw, called a fuel rod. So fuel rod full of little pellets. It can have anywhere between 200 and more of these uranium pellets. Again, it's of ur ur enriched uranium, 235. So we have fuel rods full of little pellets. Now we take these fuel rods and we put them together in what's called a fuel assembly. And so what we have is basically this big box and it's full of several different fuel rods but inside this box or our fuel assembly, there's also these things called control rods. So it basically alternates. It's not exactly perfectly alternating, but it's a combination. So fuel rods and control rods. So control rods are very, very important. They are what we use as a way to make sure that we don't have a nuclear bomb, right? Something that's going to explode. We have, this is our way of controlling our reaction. And so what we have are control rods, which again are these big stack, these vertical columns that are basically either boron or cadmium, and they are used because they readily absorb neutrons, okay? Very, very important. So these are just perfect metals that we basically just stick in between these fuel rods. So when our fuel rods are going through our chain reactions and they're releasing all these neutrons, we have these control rods that are sitting there right next to the fuel rods and they're just like, oh yeah, I want these neutrons. And they just eat up all the neutrons to make sure that there's no way that the neutrons then hit another fuel rod is starting another chain reaction. So it's a way to control the reaction. All right, so now this horribly drawn thing that I have is called a fuel assembly. So that's what's right here on the right side. So our fuel assembly has our nuclear fuel rods that are full of fuel pellets, enriched pellets, and then our fuel assembly has fuel rods and control rods. So now once we have this thing called our fuel assembly, what we do is we put it inside of what's called a primary coolant. Basically, we submerge it underwater. And so what we can do is look at this picture right here, and we have kind of a, a side angle from it, if that makes sense. We're kind of looking down into this pool. And so it's a circular pool, kind of a sphere. It's a tall, uh, spherish shape, I guess. And so what we have is it's full of what's called a primary coolant. So primary coolant, usually we use what's called boric acid, and that's because it has boron in it. And so boric acid is H3BO3, and this boron readily absorbs the neutron. So it's really good. But we also use this situation, the primary coolant, to keep the fuel assembly cool, right, to control our, our reactions. But we also use it as a way to harness the energy and move it through the power plant, move it away from the, re um, from the fuel assembly, move it away from the fuel assembly, and actually bring it to our turbine and our generator, just like in a conventional power plant. So let's look through that system here. And I'm going to draw it for you. And now bear with me here because it's a little uh, difficult to draw. But we have our fuel assembly, right? Which is our big box that has a lot of different control rods and fuel rods in it. So we're going to start simple. These right here, control rods. They can be moved. So they can be inserted when you want to control and make sure the reaction is very, very slow, or you can pull them out and let a lot of reactivity happen down here. So usually it's safest when you have them in, 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 in. All right, so there's your control rods. Now, in between the control rods, we have our fuel rods. 
And now around all of this, you have what's called your primary coolant. So you're completely submerging it here. Primary coolant. Your primary coolant does two things. It pulls the energy away from the fuel rods, but it also absorbs any excess neutrons that kind of escaped and got out. And so what we do is we pump our primary coolant into what's called a steam generator. So our primary coolant goes through this and it goes into our steam generator. Now it's very, very important to stress this, that our primary coolant is kept separate from our steam generator. They're not actually touching each other, but their pieces are intermingling, but the actual fluids, the liquids in each component are not touching. So now what liquid am I talking about in the steam generator? Well, it's filled of H2O. This is our steam generator. It's filled of water, liquid water. But now this primary coolant has absorbed all of the energy that was given off from this reaction. And so this energy is going to be really, really hot. So as soon as this primary coolant from the pipe essentially touches the water in the steam generator, this it's going to absorb that the thermal energy from the primary coolant and our liquid water is immediately going to turn into steam. Okay. Now, just like before in our conventional power plant, we know what happens when we, we take our steam. We pump it out and we put it into our turbine. Okay, so we have our turbine. We know that our turbine is then connected to a generator. And then we use our generator to release it out into our community, okay? So we take our kinetic energy, and then we use our kinetic energy. We put it into the turbine where we convert it to mechanical energy. From there, we can use our generator to convert our mechanical energy to electrical energy, and then we have our electricity out. But it doesn't end here. We have a whole other cycle we need to consider. So we have steam that moved through the turbine. Once it hits the turbine, it moves the turbine, it moves out. And that's when it goes to a condenser. So the steam comes out of the turbine, goes directly into the condenser, and so we try to condense our steam. So as steam goes in, liquid water, H2O in the liquid state, comes out. So this comes here, right, comes out, it goes into your steam generator. So that's how we get all this water in here originally. So you've got water that's filled here, more water, in your condenser. So three different cycles, right? All right, so now, where does this water come from? Well, this water comes from a pool. Over here, we have a pool that has another cycle. So we're pumping in cold water in. It's going this way. It's coming into our condenser, and then we're pumping warm water out. H2O, and that's going this way. So we use our pool to cool it down. So Stick with me here. We've got our control rods here. They're releasing energy. Our energy is absorbed by our primary coolant, and so our primary coolant then just moves in the cycle and it goes into the steam generator. So now our primary coolant in a separate pipe, a separate tube, then interacts with our water. So our water surrounds the pipe and it, the pipe's really, really hot and it's able to absorb the thermal energy. So it goes from here in our liquid state. Our liquid water then converts into our uh, vapor, our water vapor, or steam. And so now the steam then moves moves in the form of kinetic energy to the turbine, and the turbine then starts to spin. Now we know when this starts to spin that the turbine is connected to a coil of wires that are connected inside the generator, and then we have our field that's in our generator, which then is allowed for us to take our mechanical energy and convert it into electrical energy, okay? That's the important part. That's how we take our energy, we harness it, and release it out to the general public. Now though, our cycle isn't done here, so we come back to our turbine. So our steam that came from our steam generator goes through the turbine, it comes out, it hits our condenser. In the gaseous state, it hits our condenser. It, now it's feeling our cold water, cold, cold water here. It goes, our steam then hits the cold water and all that thermal energy runs from the steam to the cold water. And so by the time it gets out of the condenser, we're talking about how we have what is called liquid water and it goes into the steam generator. Now the last thing we have is our pool all the way here on the right side. Our pool then takes the warm water in, it cools it down. We pump cold water out into our condenser. So now this is essentially the main part of our nuclear power plant, but I've left the most important thing off of this and we have one giant containment structure and so the containment structure goes all the way around the primary coolant it goes all the way around the steam generator and it comes up right here okay this part right here scroll up just a little bit to have a little bit of space this container is called our containment structure and it is our last piece of protect 
protection, I guess you could call it. And so it's made out of steel. So really, really strong metal. It's made out of steel to contain all of the nuclear reactivity or anything. So in the, in the off chance that something bad happens, it's all encased in this giant steel structure to make sure that regardless of what goes on in this reactor, we make sure that everybody else and its inhabitants nearby, the employees, everybody is safe, 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 safe by putting it in a steel structure. All right, so now we have several different cooling systems in here. We have a primary coolant, which is full of our boric acid. We have all this stuff. It's very, very complicated, but if you weren't able to follow that, here is a beautiful picture that is provided from our chemistry and context textbook. And so you can go through the whole thing again. So you can see your primary coolant, you can see the control rods, you can see the fuel rods, you can see it go into the steam generator. You can see where the steam comes out, goes to the turbine. Then from the turbine, it goes to the generator and out to the general public. But then the steam comes down, it hits the condenser. The condenser from the warm water is going out to the pool, the cool water is coming in. And then the, the steam that came in was able to condense, go from the gaseous state to the liquid state and then back into the steam generator. All right, I've now explained it three times. Hopefully one of those times it sinks in and it's very clear about what happens. If you, this doesn't make sense, please take a second and go read more about it. Just Google uh, nuclear reactors and just read about it if it's not making sense, if there's something that just isn't clicking because this is so, so cool and I really, really, really want you to understand the schematic of it. All right, so now let me ask you two different questions here. The first one, if the control rods are completely, completely submerged, will any nuclear reactions occur? Okay, that's the first question. The second question I want you to answer, same type of thing, but instead of being completely submerged, if they are completely removed. Will any nuclear reactions occur? Okay, so those are our two questions. Completely submerged, completely removed. Go. All right, did you get an answer? Hopefully you did, but if you didn't, don't worry about it. So if the control rods are completely submerged, so they're all the way in, 100% in, will any nuclear reactions occur? Absolutely not, because the control rods are blocking, so there's no way from one neutron to go from one fuel rod to another fuel rod, so it's not going to work. What if the control rods are completely removed, so they're completely taken out? Will any nuclear reactions occur then? Yes, absolutely. Will any nuclear reactions occur? 100%, because the control rods have been completely been removed. That is dangerous. That is crazy. That would never, ever happen unless somebody who is not trained decided to start working at a nuclear reactor, so I don't know how that would ever happen happen. So control rods are one of the most important things. They make sure that our chain reactions are not going to be uncontrolled in the same manner that happens in a nuclear weapon. All right. We use our control rods to make sure that we do this properly, safely, and we do an awesome, awesome way of having an alternative source of energy. Take care of yourself. Drink water.